Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to sample the different microscopy techniques uh, that are used in microbiology. So in the last video, if you remember, we talked about light microscopy specifically, and we focused on what the requirements for light microscopy are, and we talked a little bit about the different types of light microscopy or the different types of light microscopes, specifically bright field, dark field, and phase contrast microscopy. We're going to talk a little bit more about those three, but we're going to expand the list of microscopes to include all of the different uh, microscopy techniques, including electron microscopy. So um, this video will be a little longer than the last one. Uh, get ready, take notes, okay? Microscopy techniques are, like I said uh, from the previous video, they can be the bright field microscope uh, or bright field microscopy. They can be dark field microscopy, phase contrast microscopy, differential interference contrast microscopy, DIC, fluorescence microscopy, fluorescent antibody technique, using antibodies, confocal microscopy, two photon microscopy or TPM, super resolution microscopy, scanning acoustic microscopy, electron microscopy, which gets into the transmission electron microscopy, TEM, and SEM, scanning electron microscopy, as well as scanning tunning uh, or scanning tunneling microscopy, STM, and atomic force microscopy. Scanned probe microscopy is another technique that we will not focus on in this class, but it is a, a variety of microscopy techniques. So, um, as you can see from this list, there are a bunch of them. This isn't even all inclusive of the different microscopy techniques. I know that there's a lot, and it, and it sounds like they're all very similar. They do have slight differences in some cases, or um, distinct uh, substantial differences in some cases as well. So, for the purposes of this class, we're going to focus on these six, um, at least for this particular lecture. And so, um, like last lecture, I, I focused a little bit in that time or in that lecture about bright field microscopy. I included it in this list just as a uh, kind of a control or a standard that we can then can uh, uh, measure or compare all these other microscopy techniques to. The reason I'm including bright field as the control is that it is the normal con, uh, compound light microscope that, that you've become so accustomed to using. So in bright field microscopy, like we said in the last lecture, this is a very simplistic way of using light to observe specimens. We can see dark objects um, against a bright background. We have contrast between the background and the organism. There isn't much contrast between the structures within the, the organism, but we can clearly see the organism against a clear or light background. Um, this type of microscopy uh, does not collect the reflected light meaning when we shine light through the specimen, we are collecting the light in the ocular lens or in the objective lens, but ultimately funnels through the ocular lens of just the light that's traveling through the specimen, not the light that's being reflected off. And so this technique shows the internal structures and the outline of the transparent uh, pellicle, but it doesn't give you much contrast between the internal structures of the cell. So it's very limited, okay? If we compare that to differential interference contrast microscopy, or DIC, you can definitely see from this image that the, the image is much clearer. There is a lot of contrast between the internal structures as well as contrast between internal and external features. This particular type of microscopy is going to use two beams of light that are going to travel through two different prisms, which are going to both... Uh, split the light beams um, separately, which gives more contrast and color to the specimen. As you can see in this organism, it almost has a 3D image, um, and that's because we're using two different light beams with two different prisms, which are going to split the light differently. Those uh, two prisms uh, splitting the light differently are going to bounce the light waves off of the object in different angles, and so it's going to give a more complete picture. Uh, similar to the phase contrast microscopy we talked about in the last lecture. The resolution of the DIC microscope is higher than that of standard phase contrast microscopy. Also, the resolution is higher than the typical bright field microscopy as well. And because we use two different prisms with two different beams of light, it's going to open up a, a greater um, spectrum of, of colors. And so the image in this particular type of microscopy is brightly colored. 
and appears nearly three-dimensional, as I said before. Okay, there is a big uh, sub substantial improvement over the bright field microscopy, which basically just gave us the shape of the bacterium. It didn't really differentiate internal structures, but in this particular microscope, um, we can clearly differentiate uh, the internal structures as well as internal versus out, uh, external structures. Okay, in the fluorescent antibody technique, this is a, a way of using actual very short wavelengths, specifically UV. So this is the first technique that we've talked about so far in this course that uses UV. It does not use visible light. Um, UV or ultraviolet is much shorter in wavelength than visible light. And so uh, because it's shorter wavelength, we're actually able to kind of uh, have a higher or increased resolving power but in this particular technique, because it is antibody technique, we are actually going to use antibodies, okay? And from your previous uh, biology classes, you should know what an antibody is. It's a specific protein that is going to bind to an antigen. But in this particular technique, we're going to uh, adhere a fluorescent substance to the antibodies, basically causing the antibodies to hold on to the substance that will fluoresce under UV light. And so um, by adhering the fluorescence to the antibodies and then attaching the antibodies to the substance of the external features of the cell, we're actually able to stain the cell with the fluorescent dye, um, specifically called fluorochromes. And um, these bacteria cells don't normally fluoresce because they don't normally have these antibodies with the fluorescent material attached. But when we do attach them, they do fluoresce. And so we're actually able to see them almost glow in the dark um, against a very dark background, which allows us to see not internal structures, but at least see external shape. Um, and so this, this technique can detect bacteria or other pathogenic microorganisms from their shape, not necessarily from internal structures. But it is a different technique and allows us to use technologies in different ways. Confocal microscopy, again, is kind of uh, similar to the fluorescent antibody technique in that it is going to use very short wavelength light. It's also going to use fluorochrome dyes, um, which allows it to be brightly colored, uh, like you see in this image. But it's going to excite a single plane of the specimen, meaning we're not just going to see the shape of the organism, we're actually going to dive in and see some internal structuring. Each plane in a specimen is illuminated, and a three-dimensional image is constructed with a computer. This is the first time in this list of microscopy techniques where the light is starting to be absorbed by a computer, and three-dimensional images are generated as a result of that. And so it can examine layers of cells to a depth of 100 micrometers, which uh, the resolving power, like I said, as we go down this list, kind of keeps getting a little bit better and better. Two-photon microscopy looks very similar if you just compare picture to picture to confocal microscopy, but in this particular technique, the cells are still stained with the fluorochrome dyes. However, um, instead of using like one plane, now we're using two photons or two planes. So we're going to use long wavelength red light and we're going to use basically um, the fluorochromes and the long wave in order to excite the dyes. And, can, and so we can study living cells up to one um, millimeter deep. So it's not quite as intense. The, the, the long wave radiation is less intense than the short wave but it gives us a different technique in order to observe different types of internal structuring. Super resolution microscopy is going to be slightly different, although the, the picture looks very similar to two photon microscopy and confocal microscopy, uh, microscopy, but this particular technique uses two laser beams. One wavelength stimulates fluorescent molecules to glow. The second wavelength is gonna cancel out all the fluorescent except for that in one nanometer. So it's almost like we're using one laser to kind of focus on and make the fluorescent dye glow, but we're also using a second laser to cancel out all of the things we don't want to focus on. And so we still use a, compo uh, a computer to scan the specimen, but it is going to scan the specimen nanometer by nanometer and then puts the images together. And so this resolution-wise is going to be the best because nanometers are very, very small. 
okay? These are the kind of six techniques that are the most commonly used in a microscopy lab. Um, but when we go to the full list, another set of microscopes that is definitely important when we talk about viral components, because uh, viruses are much smaller than bacteria, are the electron microscopes. And electron microscopes aren't just used to focus on and to study viruses. There are a lot of bacterial cellular components and internal structuring components that that are small enough that require electron microscopy techniques and so we need to understand the difference between transmission and scanning electron microscopes. Transmission electron microscopy is going to observe an image internally and scanning electron microscopy is going to look at an image on the external structures. Okay? Scanning electron microscopes are going to scan the external features. It's not going to transmit through or transfer through a specimen. It's literally just going to scan the surface. And transmission is going to travel through almost like an x-ray in order for us to determine internal structuring. So transmission is going to transfer through. Scanning electron microscopy is going to scan the surface. Okay, so if you had kind of a buzzword to help you remember, scanning and surface go together. Transmission and interior is going to go together as well. The way that these both work is very similar, although there are some differences. They both use electrons as their energy source. So uh, regardless of electron, trans or electron microscopy technique, they're both going to use electrons with an electron gun uh, as their energy source. So the electrons are going to be sent from the electron gun. In both cases, they're going to travel through a chamber, which is um, a vacuum. And the reason it's a vacuum is because we don't want any molecular interference. We don't want those electrons bouncing off of molecules. We don't want them bouncing off of dust particulate. We don't want them bouncing off of water vapor. We want them bouncing off of our molecule that we're looking at, whether it be DNA, proteins, um, lipids, internal cellular structuring. We want it to bounce off the object that we are focusing on, and that's it. So it's going to be put, the specimen's going to be put into a vacuum, all of the air and exterior particulate pumped out, and it's going to be shot at by electron guns ultimately going to go through the image and all of these computers or all of this imaging is going to be sent to a computer and a um, an, inter uh, an interior view of that specimen at least in a transmission electron microscopy technique is going to be generated in a scanning electron microscopy technique we're going to shoot the electrons at a specimen but the specimen will not absorb the electrons or the electrons will not travel through the specimen they will bounce off in all directions and that particular um, electron bouncing angles will be calculated by an electron collector and then uh, amplified into a viewing screen or a computer in order for us to generate an actual really good clear three-dimensional view of that particular organism, okay? So as you can see, there are a variety of microscopy techniques. All of them are going to give us slightly different data, but all of them can be used in a way that gives us a full three-dimensional picture of the microbe and its external and interior structuring. If you thought the video was useful, come to class, let me know about it, take your notes, bring your notes to class, bring your questions to class. I'll see you soon.